Um, hello, welcome to this edition of Let's Talk Forensic Psychology. Um, today we're talking about um, working within forensic settings uh, in, in Broadmoor Hospital in particular. So we're talking to Gwen Adstead, who's a forensic psychotherapist and a consultant forensic psychiatrist. Um, and she has been a visiting lecturer at Gresham College and at Yale, and she currently works at Broadmoor. So very, you're very welcome, Gwen. Lovely to meet you again. Oh, lovely um, to meet you too, Jerry. So we just wondered if you wanted to talk a bit about your route into your job and how you decided to do this role. Absolutely. Well, um, I started, I, I trained first, obviously, in general psychiatry, because that's how everybody trains. And then I specialized in forensic work. And I was interested in forensic work, I think, mainly because I was interested in the law. And I was also interested in ethical issues um, to do with forensic psychiatry, particularly the, some of these very vexing kinds of philosophical questions about how responsible is somebody and how do we hold somebody responsible? How do we think about holding people responsible where you can see that they knew what they were doing, but you can also see that their decisions are affected by not only mental illness, but also psychological distress and psychosocial impairment. So, so it was, I was really drawn to forensic psychiatry because of that. And then, so I did my forensic training, which was then about four years. And while I was doing that, I really thought, well, I'd really like to train to be a therapist because I could see that if I didn't do that, I would probably not spend as much time talking to the patients as I would like. Um, everybody else would do the talking to the patients apart from me. So, um, so I then trained as a group therapist. And I also went away and did some research as well about trauma, which turned out to be very helpful. And I spent um, a couple of years working in a trauma clinic at the beginning of the week in Broadmoor at the end of the week. And, and of course, those two populations were very similar in lots of ways. Um, and then I came to Broadmoor and I was a consultant psychotherapist there for many years. I went away for a bit and worked in a medium secure unit and then came back again. Uh, and along the way, I also trained in mindfulness based cognitive therapy and mentalization based therapy. So I see myself as someone who's a kind of all purpose psychological therapist uh, with offenders. And, and, and I, I say I really wanted to do that because I guess like many of us who become psychological therapists, I was interested in people's stories mm -hmm. um, and hearing what they had to say. So that's my that's my routine, if you like. I think it's so interesting, isn't it? Because I in all the work we've done, it, there's always a backstory. Sometimes people will say that to you, God, you know, how do you work with people that you work with or, you know, men, women, children, whoever. And they see, they see a name or, or a headline and, and actually there's always this backstory. Yeah. And, it, and it is so fascinating. It is. It is completely fascinating. And, and also, you don't have to work for very long in this field to realise that very serious violence is comparatively unusual. So actually, every story becomes even more interesting because you need to understand all the risk factors and all the, and, and all the things that went wrong um, in order to understand how this person came to be at that moment with that victim at that time. And if you don't really understand that in depth and with nuance, then you're going to miss something. So if you're going to do a good job as a forensic psychologist or psychiatrist or psychotherapist or whatever it is, you need to be good at taking a history, listening to a story, understanding the narrative from this person's perspective, because otherwise you won't get a proper grasp of how on earth they came to let themselves do this horrendous thing, which is almost certainly the reason that you're meeting them. Mm. And building relationships, because that's the difficult thing if people don't trust you enough to talk about such so difficult things. Yeah, we, I think sometimes we overestimate how easy it is. We go in and start talking to someone, expect them to talk about something so personal and private and something they've maybe never talked about in their life. Um, that's not an easy thing to, for us to do, for anybody to do. Well, and, and I must say, I, I, I realise that the hard way. I mean, mm. you know, I mean, when I was training as a forensic psychiatrist, you know, it was part of my training. I was, you know, I was just told that I, I should go in and ask people about their index offence. You know, I'd be sent off to Broadmoor to assess somebody about whether they were fit to move on to medium security. And, and I was expected to ask them all about their offending and about their index offence. And, and, you know, nobody ever suggested to me that this might be difficult for the people mm -hmm. I was seeing. I mean, and I look back and I think, how callous was I? 
really. But it's something about, and there is something about when you're a trainee that you're very focused on being a trainee and getting things right. And you, you know, but I do sometimes wonder that in our training, we don't sufficiently um, appreciate or tell people that the people that we meet, the, uh, the prisoners that we meet, the patients that we meet, are, are, are people who may well be ashamed of what they've done and um, and actually to to and frightened to think about it and to look at it again they're very reluctant and mm. so if somebody bowls along and says tell me about this index offense you committed without getting to know them a bit first or at least just saying look I guess this might be a bit difficult but can you tell me a bit just something that is a bit more human and um, and makes it clear that you understand that these things are not always easy to talk about. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm sure we're going to come on to talk about this, but that relational perspective is going to be absolutely crucial when it comes to building a therapeutic base if, and if we're talking about trying to get people to change their minds for the better. I think that's one of the most difficult things is I think, you know, for victims of violence that might listen to this sort of discussion, you know, how can you show people compassion and empathy? But I think actually, if you're trying to help people see what compassion and empathy is, then if you're not modeling that and you're not being compassionate, you know, it's almost, yeah, it sort of you know, takes you in a different direction. Well, you're not going to find out what you want to know if you go in and ask questions in a kind of hostile interrogatory way. And I, I think that this is a misunderstanding, isn't it, uh, about what people like us do. And, that, and it, it's, it seems to me very natural that victims of violence are often very angry and, and, and really want the people who've hurt them to be punished. And that seems to me to be very human and very natural. But of course, it's no part of our role to be punitive towards either prisoners or patients. The state does that. No, we don't do that. It would be quite wrong if we did that. There's no, we have no role in being punitive. But also, um, in you know, if we really want to do a good job, we're going to try and build a kind of therapeutic dialogue which enables this person to take the risks that they need to take to really look at what they've done and to think about what it would cost them to change for the better. So, but I think, uh, Laura, what you're saying makes me think that, of course, that some victims of violence uh, entirely reasonably say, well, who's providing a therapy for us? Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, is a whole other ball game. Mm -hmm. uh, and they aren't alternatives. We need therapy for offenders and we need therapy for victims. But of course, we work with both of those things in mind. And, um, and we will ask about your book, but I think you said it in your book quite clearly that we have to hold these two positions in mind all the time. And, and we do. I mean, working with Geraldine, we spent many time talking about these two different roles and, and what comes first. You know, do we help people think about their traumatic backstories that have brought them to this point or do we focus on the risky behaviors that, that that people need protecting from from time to time yeah yes it's holding it all in mind is is something quite special in our roles I think well and I, I think it's it's you, I mean you're right I mean I certainly found that when I was training as a forensic psychotherapist this uh, this idea that there are sort of victims over here and perpetrators over here obviously doesn't make any sense because we know that most people who have committed acts of serious violence, not all, but most have experiences of significant childhood trauma and victimization and indeed sometimes adult victimization as well. And there's that uh, very interesting study in HMP Park from a couple of years ago that showed that nearly half of the prisoners there who committed violent offenses had been exposed to four or more kinds of childhood trauma. So, so you know, we have to deal with that in order to know how people got into a state of mind where they let themselves do these things. But I think you're absolutely right, Laura, the challenge is to be able to hold both those things, a kind of binocular uh, vision, and to hold them both in mind. Um, 
Well, I, I, and I think that I was very struck by this, that, you know, I remember one a patient that I work with here in the hospital here, very significant childhood trauma. You know, he said to me, you know, I don't understand why you're going on about my childhood trauma all the time. You know, not everybody who suffers this kind of childhood trauma does what I did. Mm -hmm. And he was right. He was absolutely right about that. And, and that's a kind of nuance and complexity that we also have to get our heads around and, and to acknowledge and to say, so yes, that's true. So the question is then, how was it that your particular experience mm -hmm. took you to this place? Um, but I would always make it my business to say, to use that language of how did you let yourself do this? Because clearly they did let themselves do it at some level. And, and making sure that they take ownership is a really important part of the work. Um, if there isn't any agency there, then they won't have the agency for change, for positive change either. And all this wonderful work that, that Shad Maroon has done about the, the system seems to me to be very important here. So, um, and so that's one of the things that I was trying, as you said, to trying um, with these wonderful case stories that Eileen and I were able to develop, trying to communicate something of the complexity of the stories of the people that we meet in our work. One of the questions I had about your work, um, how do you manage this? Because being in the hospital setting, obviously some people take medications compared to perhaps when you're working with trauma in the prisons and, and you, don't, you don't see it as much, I don't think. How do you balance that out, working with medication and working in therapy? Well, I suppose, I, I mean, I guess, I think one of the... One of the, the slightly worrying things for me about um, the world I work in is that when I started off in psychiatry, it was a very, it was much more psychologically informed. And there was a real, a real recognition of the importance of a psychologically based psychiatry. Um, the biopsychosocial model was taken very seriously, and um, and we didn't we didn't have this idea of there's there's mental illness over here with diagnoses and medication and everything else over there. And 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 I've never worked that way, and I never will work that way because it seems to me that you know, the most effective way, all the data tells us that the most effective way is to take people seriously as complex biopsychosocial organisms, part of the biosphere, uh, possibly part of, a, part of a noosphere too, if you believe in that. Um, and, um, and I think that you know, taking every person seriously as a complex human being who has um, who, who may have disorders, you know, disorders which respond well to medication, but that, that's not going to undermine the psychological experience. In fact, I mean, you know, there are many situations where a little bit of medication is the thing that helps people get into therapy, because otherwise they're a bit all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I... I I, I completely understand the arguments that say that, you know, people using medication as a kind of defense against thinking, and obviously we, we're not for that. But, uh, but most of the time, I think uh, um, I would certainly say to people, well, look, you know, why don't we try some medication just to make you feel a little more grounded and a little more organized in your mind. And then when you feel you're, you've got that kind of security of mind. That's the time that we can start these therapies because as you both say, we know that these therapies can sometimes be painful. So we want, we need people to be feeling reasonably coherent when they start them. You can't just go bowling in. In your book, you, you developed a number of case studies. How did you decide out of the sort of numerous people you've worked with, uh, which of those people to sort of think about and talk about in the way you did? Well, um, I was, perhaps if I can give a little backstory myself to the, to, to the book, I had wanted to write a book about cruelty and about evil for a long time because I uh, had often found myself, you know, talking about this in public spaces, as I imagine the two of you do sometimes, you know, to, you know what's going on with these people, what's wrong with them, what's... No. So I wanted to try and write a book about that, but I, 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 but I wanted to write it for a lay, for a non-professional audience. I wanted to write that book that anybody could read, because again, these are subjects and topics that everyone's interested in. Now, every single citizen you know, is interested in this. So, 
So I tried to write this book and I just couldn't do it. I just, I just couldn't find the right voice. I couldn't find the right tone. And then Eileen Horn, who's an old friend of mine, who's also a uh, sort of professional dramatist. She was independent television producer for many years, but also does work for Radio 4. And she's a professional storyteller. <laughs> and she said, well, look, why don't I help you? <laughs> why don't I help you? Um, and why don't we use case stories to illustrate what you're trying to talk about? And... Um, and I said, well, that's really important. I think that's an excellent idea. But then how are we going to think? We've got to think about confidentiality and privilege. So she said, well, the, you know, it, you, we could take lots of tiny fragments from lots of people that you've seen. I mean, and I've seen you know, a few hundred people in a working lifetime, if I include all the cases mm -hmm. that, um, that I've seen. So the idea was that we took tiny fragments from lots and lots of different stories and build them up as a kind of mosaic picture of a kind of person so that the stories are clinically real you know that every single person who works in business will recognize that per those those people but they're not an actual person that you can google <laughs> um, and that was obviously to protect the people i've worked with but also to protect victims and victims families as well so that was very very important to us to to respect that privilege and that boundary so then the next question was what will what kind of cases will we go through and there are you know, a number of cases that would stay with me through my work that i wanted to do I wanted to talk about, clearly wanted to talk about people who killed when they were mentally ill, I wanted to talk about people who um, committed homicide. Uh, I wanted to talk about child sexual abuse because I ran a therapy group for people who'd abused, sexually abused their children a long, long time ago. It was very informative, very instructive for me. Um, and we also wanted to talk about women. And so we had, we, this was a difficult decision because we had a disproportionate number of women for the proportions in the prisons. But I spent, I spent quite a number of years now working in a women's prison and I just felt that these are people who sometimes don't get properly heard. And I, so I concluded that it was probably better to have a slightly disproportionate number of women to make sure that their, their problems really got flagged up. Mm. And it's really difficult then, so they're not identifiable given that there's so few of them. But, well, um, indeed, no, yeah. exactly, exactly. So, um, so we chose, so we had a story about stalking, which just reflects the large and you know, quite significant subgroup of women who are stuck in prison because of stalking related offences. Uh, we chose someone, uh, we created a story around joint enterprise homicide in a, t in a young, in a teenage woman. And again, there's a lot of those. And that, that was partly based also on some young men I've met with in similar circumstances. Um, and then we picked someone who committed arson, because that's another offence that gets you stuck in prison, as a woman in particular, gets you stuck in prison for a long time. Um, so we wanted so that was really trying to get across and then i wanted to to try and to get across the sort of range of different defenses that women face and then i very much wanted to have someone from the family courts because i do a lot of work in the family courts and and laura this lines up with the work that you're doing now in perinatal mental health service because i found myself outraged by seeing women sometimes for the third time of having their child removed um, and because they couldn't get the help that they needed and it is outrageous to me uh, still you know, you know we're a wealthy nation with lots of resources that we can't or won't help women who struggle to look after their children who struggle to be a mum who don't perhaps like it or find the role uncomfortable or or frightening or whatever it happens to be and I really wanted to try and get across the terrible conflicts and challenges that those women uh, face. Um, so although the woman in question wasn't a violent offender, she was someone who was someone who had failed her children and caused them harm. And I wanted to get that, make sure that they didn't get, uh, pe women who do that don't get lost. With every, it's very fascinating with every um, kind of people that you work with. I imagine it's the same for you is there's always these um, attachments and looking back at who were the caregivers and um, you know how, how did it help that person develop and grow and so it just sounds fascinating that you've tried to capture different types of people 
you know, in your book. It must have been really hard to sort of narrow it down to certain people when there's been so many. Well, I, I mean, I was greatly helped in, in, in this. I mean, say partly writing with somebody else. I would always recommend writing with a co-author if you can, because it means that you have somebody to bounce ideas off. And also the wonderful thing that Eileen was able to do um, was she was able to ask the questions um, which I, as a professional, wouldn't ask because they're, they're, they're part of my bread and butter, so I don't think about them as being professional or interesting anymore. You know, what's a section 3741? You know, you know, that's not interesting. Yes, it is. You know, um, what's a diminished responsibility defense? You know, why is that interesting? Oh, that's why. You know, so, so Eileen could ask those questions. But I think the other thing that I was interested in is actually. Many years ago, I trained in the use of the adult attachment interview. And um, which, uh, for people who don't know, is a way of assessing attachment in adults and is generally thought to be the gold standard for assessing attachment. And this is because, because what you do is you generate uh, a, a, an attachment narrative using a, system, a series of probe questions. But the probe questions often generate a kind of text where people unconsciously say something about their uh, their memories. Actually, it, 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 the questions are not socially obvious in terms of their desirability. So, um, uh, so the, and the idea is that it, what you get out of that is, is, is that you get a sense of people's security with respect to people who they feel close to or need it or vulnerability. But the thing about the adult attachment interview is it trains you to look at narrative and how people speak as well as the content of what they say. And that, for those of us who are psychological therapists, is really interesting because in the end, we only have words. The words we speak, the words they speak, the words we listen to. We have to make sense of what people say. So we need to get good at really listening and going deep in our interpretation of what people say. And, and I found that the adult attachment interview training did that for me, as it taught me to, to listen deeply, <laughs> to just not go and stay on the surface. The surface is not only important, sometimes the surface is very important, but to, to go deep when I had to, um, and to listen. Mm. We, we've done quite a lot of discussions around risk assessment and how you look at what's within someone, what's outside of somebody, what influences somebody. And I think one of the things we've been working, I think in forensic psychotherapy and, and psychology world is this idea that things protect people, mm -hmm. um, that it's not always the bad, that actually there are good things and strengths that people have that you can build on and, and improve. Is that something that you, you, know, you do at Broadmoor? Are you focusing on the kind of strength-based work? Yes, I, I think that's, and that's been a very, as you say, it's been a very important change in the last 25 years. I mean, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, when I started at Broadmoor, you know, there were very kind of sort of thick, what you might think of thin formulations um, about what made people act violently, whereas I think the the attention to risk, need, responsivity kind of models. I think that's been helpful. I think the good lives model has been incredibly helpful uh, for thinking about prisoner rehab in a different way and about not assuming that, <clears throat> not assuming that we, we can't define people in terms of their offense. And I think that you know, one of the things that, that we need to beat a drum for, and of course, most of us do this anyway, we don't talk about people in terms of their offenses. We don't say that, no, that's Derek, he's a rapist. We say, that's Derek, he committed a very unpleasant rape when he was 21. He is now 41. <laughs> Um, and he has done a lot of work on this and done a lot of work on that and he knows that he's vulnerable on this and we know that he's vulnerable about that these are the risk factors that we think would be important you know he understands his hatred of women to come from this a b and c and that, that we, but we don't just we don't just wipe people out under a term for an offense um so there's something about trying to to look beyond the nature of the label of the offence, to look at people's strengths and weaknesses, and, and, and as you say, and we have to build on people's strengths in order for therapy. They're not going to come for a therapy that helps them change their minds for the better unless 
they also have a reason to believe that hope uh, that change is possible and um and we have to work out don't we when we're working as therapists we have to work out whether this is someone who um has has the potential to believe in the possibility of change um and if and, and the the most difficult time we find here in the hospital here is is when we think a person has the potential for change but they don't think so <laughs> um that they they're not interested in changing i'm fine i'm fine as i am it's all you bastards <laughs> mm. if only you both would just leave me alone i'd be fine <laughs> um and that's the most difficult to, um situation i think mm -hmm. um sometimes where you see where you think that somebody could maybe make a difference you know, something could make a difference but you just can't convince them that it's that it's worth taking the risk i think even with supervising trainees you know you're always coming back to that idea of working with teams working with people what's the resistance how, how can we push through this and Oh, yeah, it, it is definitely one of the biggest things, I think, in forensic working. It really is. And I think and I think you're you're right that we always have to keep an eye out for where the resistance is. And often it's located in the patient or the prisoner, but often it's not. Um, <laughs> often it's located elsewhere. And then it's a question, isn't it, of understanding what that resistance is about? Um, and you know, we've. I'm guessing that all of us, all three of us, have worked in, in teams sometimes where the whole team, you know, sort of really hated the patient, you know, because of X, Y, or Z. Maybe because they were very assaultive or whatever, whatever it happens to be. So sometimes that resistance comes from a place of anger and fear, but sometimes the resistance will come from we just don't want to think about this offence. This offence is too difficult to think about. We just want to focus on this person as a victim. We want to focus on how nice they are because that's easier for us. And, you know, we can have a nice time with this patient. If they're nice to us and we're nice to them, we just won't think about that horrible thing they did at all. <laughs> um, and, and that's one thing if they're going to be indefinitely detained. <laughs> but it's quite another if there's some chance that they might apply for parole or apply to be released or, so um so we it's those who's got the resistance i sometimes think of it as being like a ball poison ball that you toss between who's got the resistance and and what's what's the resistance about and it could be us that's the other thing i mean it could be me you know i mean it's, it's, i mean i could have i could have the resistance yeah, yeah. how do you keep yourself resilient then how do you keep you and the team and working with all these difficult material? Well, um, I mean, this is going to sound terribly sort of basic, but actually it, it comes from the mindfulness training, I think. Uh, the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy training was really helpful to me. I started it because um, we had a spate of suicides in the hospital. Um, this is some a long time ago now, this is over a decade ago. And we had a spate of suicides in the hospital. And I was a bit concerned that a lot of our guys had uh, treatment resistant depression. Um, and, um, and so, and you probably know that, that uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is actually one of the few psychological therapies that's been the subject of a few randomized controlled trials that show that it's actually quite effective in, in reducing relapse in chronic depression. So I thought, well, that sounds like the therapy for us. <laughs> we need to know more about that. So I went off and did the training. And I did learn about, about uh, reducing relapse and depression. And that's a whole other story. But what I really learned about was the importance of taking, um, of taking emotions seriously when they arise and being present with them and being honest and authentic about that. So trying not to pretend that I wasn't angry if I was, or upset if I was, or sad if I was, but also trying to hold a kind of compassionate detachment to my own feelings as a, why am I getting so wound up here? I'm very conscious of feeling cross now. I'm very conscious of feeling frightened now a kind of honest and compassionate attention to my own state of mind and then by extension the minds of others that I work with so taking that seriously so no 
So abandoning the idea of people shouldn't feel that or you oughtn't feel that. Just say, what are we, what are we feeling and thinking? What is honestly, authentically going on right now in this moment? That's what mindfulness practice is. It's not about feeling blissed out. It's about actual conscious, compassionate attention to present moment experience. And I found that made me more resilient. And by sharing that, modeling that with the people I work with, I, I like to think that that has shared some resilience with them. Yeah, that's what we found on lots of trainings I've attended about compassion-focused therapy is it's much harder for us to be compassionate towards ourselves. Which is really interesting, isn't it? And it makes you wonder about something that Bowlby said a long time ago, which is that you know a proportion of people who become professional carers do so because they're dealing with unresolved you know, distress of their own, which is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But if, if the only way you're going to be a carer is by walling yourself off from your own distress, then that is probably not a long-term strategy. And actually just getting agitated with yourself for being angry or miserable or fed up is also not going to take you any further. But for me, it's about the honesty it's about being honest and truthful, because in forensic work, if we're not honest and truthful, then how can we expect the patients or prisoners to be? You know, we have to model a kind of honesty. It comes down to being honest, um, really honest, which isn't always easy, of course, but I think it's really important. I was thinking that if you're working with people in a relational way, but you're not being relatable, which I think comes from being, I don't know, just interested and curious. Mm -hmm. I think that's some of the things I come back to with most of the trainees or uh, assistant psychologists that I supervise is all around, um, you know, bringing, bringing some of themselves to that and having, yeah. having some thought about, you know, what, what might that be like if you were in their shoes or... Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, that, uh, I, and funnily enough, I was having a rather similar discussion with one of my supervisees last week. Um, they, they are having a very difficult time with their patient, um, not a forensic patient either, um, but a, a patient who likes to hurl abuse down the telephone at them. <laughs> they are not a pleasant experience. And so a lot of our discussion was about how unpleasant that was and how it was, it was, it was real that it was unpleasant. And I think for me, it's something about keeping it reality-based. Mm -hmm. If you're honest, then it's real. And mm -hmm. then if, you're, if it's real, then you've got more chances of addressing both the mental health aspects, the emotional distress aspects, and the risk aspects. Because the one thing that you really don't want to be in a fantasy world is, is about risk. A lot of our guys, Men and women offenders offend in a kind of fantasy state of mind. They need more reality, not less. So, so keeping things real is really important and it's grounding for both you and the patient. But I think you're right, Laura. It does that kind of honesty, a kind of reality-based engagement conveys a kind of serious interest in the other person. I am seriously interested in what you have to say. And that's what I was saying to the supervisee on Friday. I think I was saying somehow we, you have to convince this person who is abusing you that you are genuinely interested in what they are saying and why they are relating to you in this way right now. So taking them seriously, even when all they can do is hurl, is hurl abuse, but trying to take them seriously. I'm really struggling to understand What's going on for you when you call me and you know both both, both asterisk asterisk asterisk? What is going you know what is going on for you now? What what's that about for you that you're talking to me in this way? So you're taking very seriously what they're saying. You're not saying it's all right because it isn't all right, but you are wanting to convey a wish to understand. You know what and and then at the point that it's too frightening or too disturbing. Then, well. I'm not sure we can talk like this anymore today. I think, I think this is enough for today. <laughs> um, and I hope that we can pick this up again next week or tomorrow. Or this. And, um, and I invite you to help me understand why this language is important to you today. You know, but, you know, I mean, there are lots of ways, but it's, it's so much about trying to convey, as you say, conveying a serious interest. Um, and that means 
learning to give up those kind of ego-based defensive structures. You can't talk to me like that, you know, that's inappropriate. Oh, you know. Don't, don't do that. That's not, that won't help. That won't help. I mean, it will convey your crossness with the person, but it won't take your dialogue on any further. And I'm assuming that what we really want is to take the dialogue on further, not get into a argy-bargy with the patient about what's appropriate and not so appropriate. You know, that's not going to get us anywhere. So what lies ahead for you, Gwen? What are, you, what are your plans in the future? Well, um, Eileen and I are thinking about whether we write another book. Excellent. <laughs> um, what, what, I, what I think of as a difficult second album. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, um, and I think what we're thinking about is whether we could do something which focuses a bit more on these attachment issues, but perhaps only take one case and go a bit deeper, um, but maybe also look transgenerationally as well. Um, and trying to get across that, you know, the events in people's past have long, the past casts a long shadow sometimes. And that idea about traumatic memories that go through pers people's personal histories. And um, it's really important, I think, that uh, to know. I mean, and what's fascinating is that the science of epigenetics is telling us something about this. If, you're, if your mum was seriously stressed and frightened when she was pregnant with you, mm -hmm. that might actually have an impact on how your genes express in terms of your own stress hormones when you're born. So you might come into the world a bit more sensitive to traumatic stress than a child who didn't have a mum who was stressed. And that might be a step towards that answer to that very interesting question, Jerry, you were posing earlier, which is why don't all kids who are exposed to serious childhood trauma um, go on to be violent? And it may well be that there are these little flickers of information about like, epigenetics, which might be important. But also, Laura, like in the work that you do, it may be that you could have a child who has a very vulnerable mum, but maybe she gets help. And maybe that really turns things around for that child just at that moment and sets them off on a different trajectory. So, you know, there's lots of areas to look at. So that's, that's what, uh, that's what I and I are thinking about at present. Are there, are there sort of ideas around research for you? Do you get, do you get involved much with sort of research projects? I do a little bit, um, but uh, um, although I'm not, but I don't have that kind of attachment to a, a, a university and funds and everything. But I, I am involved in a, a in a couple of projects that we're trying to pursue here at the hospital. One is about looking at adverse childhood experiences in our populations, um, and. And while that's been done, that has been done in a number of different friends of populations, we actually haven't done it in a high secure uh, or a medium secure kind of setting yet, um, but it would be very interesting to do. I think, and I think we know what we're going to find, but in a way it would be helpful to confirm that and actually looking at the patterns of different kinds of childhood adversity, including, of course, the very interesting people who don't appear to have any childhood adversity. We do get some of those occasionally here uh, in a way that I think you don't get in the prison system. But we here in this hospital and the other high secures, we do occasionally get very interesting stories of people who don't apparently have any childhood adversity and then we presume some catastrophe happens psychologically that leads to the violence. Um, but the other thing we're doing is we're going to look at some of our longest staying men to try and work out what keeps a man in a place like this. I use man advisedly because all our patients are male. Uh, we don't really have a high secure female estate anymore, or rather we have 12 beds at Rampton, you know, but, you know, but because women rarely need that type of level of high security, when we talk about high secure, it's nearly always male patients. And, um, but we have a, a cohort of men who stayed here over a decade. Why are they staying? What are they doing? Well, we know what they're doing. They're doing, they're thumping people all the time. That's what they're doing. Um, but why, why are they? Why are they not? Why are they stuck? What does it mean? What does it mean to be a man in Broadmoor? I'm interested in sort of existential questions. What does it mean to be, to be a man who lives here? Um, so those are the kinds of research questions. And actually, I think those are the kinds of existential questions I think are actually quite interesting for all of us who work in forensic settings to approach people 
as, as people who are living their lives in a very particular time and place and, and, and approaching them as, as storytellers themselves with an experience to share. I look forward to reading that. Sounds well, it could be. It could be really interesting. It could yeah. be. It could be really interesting. I mean, I think. I think one of the sad things is that you know. I think that we don't really know what to do with people who are stuck. And the same is true in the prison system. You know, if you think of the guys you've met who are way over tariff, you know, who just. What's going on for them? What is it that keeps them there? We, we, I mean, if we're serious about this kind of psychological model, we think that there must be something about progress that's too costly for them, too, somehow too psychologically costly. Um, and when it's, there's a bit of a challenge, I think, to find a way to help people talk about that. And what that makes me think of is the importance of keeping an open mind. Mm. You know, and just went particularly with people who are stuck is what 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 are we not thinking about? Yeah. What's gone off our radar? Um, and, and actually, I, I do really think that whenever I'm sitting down and reflect practice with people or, or having my own supervision, or what am I not thinking about? What is the thing that's crept out of sight that maybe I should be thinking about? And 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 medication is, is an interest is an interesting one. Um, I also I think there are quite a lot of complicated things to think about, um, and say ADHD is one, ASD is another, and quite what that means, what that label means, and what it will come to mean, I think is still we're right at the beginnings of that. And the other thing I worry about a lot is ethnicity and migration stories and the trauma mm -hmm. of not just racism, but racism plus loss and racism plus exclusion. Um, I worry a lot that the psychological world in forensic is very white and of, of a very particular kind of grouping. And um, while I don't think I wouldn't support the idea that we're institutionally racist, I really don't think that's true. I do think that there's a kind of lived experience of ethnicity and diversity that doesn't always make its way into forensic psychological thinking and we need it we need to have conversations about diversity we need about migration about refugee status about the trauma of loss and the trauma of, of the trauma of being different i think it's definitely getting brought into the conversations more than it ever has yeah. Some of the committees Geraldine and I sit on, you know, they're really trying hard to yeah. think more about that now. Yeah. But well, we have an opportunity now, perhaps. I mean, perhaps, you know, the time is right to, to think about that. But the one thing that we do know is we're going to have to think about it in a complex way and not in a simplistic way. Um, that uh, we have lots to learn. We all have lots to learn. But we're going to have to keep our minds open and... Just be and be careful, be careful with making assumptions and the use of language and all those kinds of things. Mm. And be willing to learn and make mistakes. Exactly. <laughs> I think that's really important, isn't it? Because that's the other thing. If my friend and, and um, co fellow therapist, uh, Cleo Van Velsen, were here, she would, you know, she's a forensic psychotherapist and, and psychoanalyst. And, who worked a lot with people with severe personality disorder. And she would say if she were here, sometimes the, the, the progress of therapy includes falling, falling mm. and failing. Mm. And sometimes what we have to say to people is, you know, you fail, but next time fail better. <laughs> mm. um, and, and, that's, and that means that we need to be there though for people when they fail and they come back. I'm just think about your IPP, man. When they fail, when they think come back and, say, well, yeah, that's a shame. So now we need to go forward and find another way for you to go, see if we can take you on to the next piece of work, see whether we can help you fail better next time. And, and, and I, I wonder whether there's something, and that, but that kind of perspective is very, it's very, uh, it runs counter to the idea that everybody must make linear progress. Everybody must be progressing like a kind of conveyor belt. Um, whereas I think for those of us who work with people 
who've lost sight of the law, lost sight of the social communities to which they belong, they will need to fail and they may need to fail and mess up several times um, before they find their balance, if you like. Just our last question, because we always finish on a, what was your hopes? You've uh, got a hope for your sort of pathway in the future. What would be your hope? Um, well, I, um, well, I hope to keep working. <laughs> I hope to keep working and keep learning. Um, uh, I, you know, every year that go, go, goes past, I feel I learn more stuff, you know, because the human mind is like that. It's fast and deep like the ocean. And, and every year I think I learn a bit more. And so I'd like to keep working and learning, you know. That's what I'm, I'm hoping for. Um, and I'm hoping that the, I'm hoping that all of us who are interested in this world will keep working and learning and keeping open minds and talking to each other and sharing ideas and and I, I think uh, and I think I, what I really hope for is that we can each we can all help each other along the way to keep hopeful it's easy to despair sometimes particularly when your service is being cut or you know, that, you know, whatever it happens to be in particular sort of you know irritating thing that's happening you know it's very easy sometimes to feel hopeless and despairing and I wonder whether the most hopeful thing we can do is to be supportive of each other and you know and remind ourselves that this work is really worth doing if we if we help somebody a little a, a little way along their way of life and take them a little you know more along a trajectory of something a bit more pro-social or a bit richer then we would have done something really useful for them and for ourselves. And that's really worth doing. I, you know, that's really worth investing a lifetime's effort in. It just remains for us to say, let's talk forensic psychology.